Hello, I'm Corey Combs. I'm the co-founder and executive technical fellow at Ampere. I am very, very pleased and honored to be able to accept this ICAS award for innovation in aeronautics today. I'd like to personally thank President Suzuki, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Susan Ying from Ampere, who has had many years of involvement in ICAS and was an advocate for my, myself in this award. Um, I'd also like to thank the Ampere team. Um, this really was a team effort to get these electric planes in the air. I certainly didn't do it myself. Um, I really had a lot of folks helping me here. And I just really think I, I'd like to accept this award on behalf of the entire electric aviation industry uh, because it's really innovation that's occurring at an industry level. We're all feeding off of each other back and forth and really bringing this revolution about. It's not just about Ampere. It's really about this revolution that's ongoing in aviation. Um, I really think that uh, there's so many people to thank. I could go on and on and on, uh, just, but really this, this award is, is just so meaningful. And thank you for this opportunity to um, give a general lecture in electrification, the third revolution in aviation. In fact, it's a Dr. Susan Ying from Ampere who even coined the term, the third revolution in aviation. The first revolution is the piston era, um, the piston engines, lightweight pistons that enabled the Wright brothers to do their first flight. The second revolution is the jet revolution, which is um, the 1950s era uh, revolution that we're really still living in today. And the third revolution is just about to kick off, and that is enabled by electrification, um, specifically electric motors and solid state power electronics that are really driving a transformation in aviation. Now, if you want to hear about the technical details of what's happening with the third revolution in aviation, I'd encourage you to stick around another hour. Um, there's going to be a future panel, which I'll be participating in. That's going to get in a little bit more technical detail, including a Q&A that's going to give you a chance to ask more technical questions about electric aviation. However, for this panel, um, for this uh, talk, it's going to be a little bit more high level, focusing on overall industry trends and then starting by talking about Ampere as a microcosm of our industry and what we've been doing with flying electric aircraft right now and what we're going to be doing in the future and then transitioning to how us and everyone else in the industry are going to be transforming the landscape of aviation in the next one to two decades. And I'd also like to say a word to ICAS uh, Shanghai and our Chinese friends who have helped put on this event. Um, Unfortunately, I'm going to have to hold the rest of the talk in English, but it was great to be able to give a word to our uh, uh, Chinese hosts who were able to put on this event. And even though I'm not there in person today, I'm looking forward to making it back to Shanghai one of these days when things open up again. And so I'm going to actually start, though, by um, showing a video that Ampere has recently made, uh, jumping a little bit forward in time um, to our next project that's soon going to fly in the next few months. And this is a really innovative use of electric aircraft. It's an in-flight power electronics test bed really the first of its kind um, that's an electric aircraft that's exporting power to these onboard innovative systems, testing a number of systems for ARPA-E, right, the Department of Energy in the U.S. Um, we're really excited um, for that program, and I think it's going to give you a good introduction about just one of the many possibilities that electrification of aviation is going to bring. Here is our second plug-in parallel hybrid aircraft we call it the Electric Eel. This one specifically has been dubbed the Hawaii Bird after its mission to fly in Hawaii as part of a demonstration program with Mukulele Airlines on one of their essential air service routes. This is exactly the sort of real-world mission where hybrid aircraft will excel in the near term. The trip is about 60 miles as the crow flies, but more than a two-hour drive on winding roads. We could fly it in about 20 minutes to connect the main town on Maui to the isolated community of Hana. 
With the batteries charged on the Hawaii Bird, it was easy to do this round trip with a fairly quick recharge at the island's main airport in Kahului. We did this almost every day for three weeks with no issues. We flew the route up to twice a day, which emulated a frequency that would support day trips. We have the ability to test new configurations, equipment, and systems. This is the way we operate. Design, build, fly with rapid iterations throughout the development of this new technology. In fact, we've now devoted our first electric eel solely to the testing of new equipment, system architectures, software, and instrumentation. It is even equipped to test new powertrain architectures. Our first aircraft, which was the world's largest and most capable hybrid electric aircraft until it was eclipsed by our Hawaii Bird, first flew on June 6, 2019. The Cessna 337 Skymaster offered a uniquely suited and capable base aircraft for modification. Because of the centerline thrust configuration, we don't have to consider the kinds of asymmetric thrust issues that affect conventional twins. This really opens the envelope considerably for experimentation. For example, it allows safe in-flight shutdowns and restarts of the motor and the ability to easily vary the power on either power plant. Should our experimentation with some new component or configuration require an in-flight shutdown and return to the airport, this can be safely accomplished on the conventional piston engine. And it's an easy airframe to work on. We can change things around quickly and at a reasonable cost, so it facilitates experimentation. Today, it is our enduring in-flight testbed. It's complemented by Ironbird and Copperbird test benches for evaluating a range of technologies. We were really pleased that ARPA-E saw the great potential for testing new technologies in this airframe. Specifically, we are in the process of testing three devices as part of the ARPA-E circuits program. We have been gathering valuable data on the ground and soon in the air. One is a solid state breaker from the Illinois Institute of Technology. This device will be tested as a flight critical component in the powertrain. It is capable of switching the vehicle battery, pre-charging the high voltage bus, and stopping short circuits. The second is a silicon carbide inverter from the University of Arkansas. This device will be tested as a flight critical component. It provides a power dense solution for converting DC power from the battery to AC waveforms required to drive the motor. Lastly, there is a flying capacitor converter from the University of California, Berkeley. This converter's topology is power dense, scalable, and flexible. Technologies like these could ultimately reduce the weight of an aircraft, which is critical to success. This gives you an idea of what we can accomplish with this testbed aircraft. And we can be really imaginative. We can test new power distribution systems, batteries, fuel cells, motors, propellers, even new high efficiency combustion engines, either directly or as a generator. So really the sky is sort of the limit. Having two aircraft allows us to test and also to demonstrate. Here's our second aircraft again, about to be shipped to the UK. First stop, Scotland, for a series of test flights with Logan Air in July. Why do we demonstrate? It helps us engage with the whole ecosystem required to integrate electrified aircraft into the transportation network. It attracts new partners and customers. It says to governments, this is closer than you may think. And it excites and engages people who want better, cleaner, quieter, lower cost transportation. Ultimately, these vigorous test activities, exploration of new technologies, and demonstrations all over the world will get us here to ultra efficient, all new electric aircraft designs. This is our tailwind concept. We'll get there in steps, not in one great leap. That's why it's so important to innovate and test aggressively, just like we are in cooperation with RPE. Well, I hope you like seeing what we're doing currently with our EEL testbed, um, but I want to take you all the way back to 2016. Um, that was when Ampere was founded, and we were looking at the time at what would be possible in the coming years with current battery technology 
and how could we operate planes that actually had practical near-term utility. And we decided upon an iterative approach for development. Starting small, we thought that the six-seater plane, our Cessna 337 conversion, was about the right size to start off. Um, we weren't really going to be able to do a Boeing 777 all the way from LA to, to Shanghai anytime soon. And we also decided that starting hybrid, given battery energy density challenges, was really the right approach. So this plug-in parallel hybrid approach that you saw really enabled us to get into the air quickly with a plane that actually had real utility and can fly on real routes. So this picture you can see here is me actually flying in the co-pilot seat. Um, this is a real plane, really flies, and in 2019, our first version of the EEL flew in mid-2019, and it was the largest plane of any kind using electric propulsion um, if for a portion of its propulsion. And that was really a, a big step. It was a, the six-seater um, with about a 4,600-pound, 2,200-kilogram uh, gross weight. That was bigger than anything that had flown at the time. And then moving forward, we got a lot of test experience with that plane, learned a lot, refined a lot of our systems, and built a second uh, 337 conversion, our eel, which we call the Hawaii Bird. Um, that flew in 2020. And it was the first to demonstrate daily operations on an actual route used commercially. Um, and this was with our partner airline, Mokalele Airlines in Hawaii. And so this really helped us learn what it takes to fly a real electric plane on a real route. What does turnaround time look like? What does it really take to charge the plane? And we learned so much doing that. And we even have started flying that same plane in Scotland and the southwest of the UK. We flew in the Orkney Islands recently. Um, this summer, and then the plane flew an unofficial record for an electric plane, flew almost 450 miles down from Scotland to the southwest of the UK, flying out of Exeter and Bristol, um, and doing some uh, near-term flights that uh, really just ended uh, as the time of this video being made. So that really helped us learn so much about different operating environments for these electric planes. And then we have this ARPA-E testbed, which will fly in the next few months, where you saw that video earlier. And that's an upgrade of our first EO aircraft to be an in-flight power electronics testbed. So moving on from the EO, we are making significant progress on a 19-passenger Eco Otter, which is a much larger hybrid aircraft that is a conversion of the Twin Otter aircraft. Um, that was under uh, multiple NASA projects, and we're continuing some of that work ourselves. And then we can finally announce that we are working on a caravan hybrid. Um, this was announced with Textron recently um, publicly, but we've been working on the caravan for quite a while. That is also a hybrid platform, and that is going to be used by some of the same airlines that we've been doing demo demonstration flights with for the EEL. So these learnings from the EEL have directly fed in to our caravan effort. And even moving beyond the caravan, looking at the next step, beyond kind of propeller utility planes. We're doing some ducted fan electric jet subscale tests right now in our lab um, that are related to the tailwind concept aircraft that you saw earlier. When you really need to take it to the next level of performance, you're gonna see electric jets coming in the future. That is still kind of early stages, but all of these kind of near-term steps we're doing are converging to making aircraft like that a reality. So our team, based in Los Angeles, right next to SpaceX and Tesla, um, at the same airport, Hawthorne Airport, is working hard to make these a reality. But I really want to focus the rest of the time on the industry as a whole, the electric aircraft industry as a whole, and what it's going to mean beyond Ampere for the future of our industry. So rewinding all the way back to 2010, which is the first time I really started thinking seriously about electrifying aircraft, I started realizing that if you electrify aircraft, it's so much bigger than just the aircraft itself, and it's so much bigger than pure electric small planes. It actually can touch every segment of our industry, and it's really based on two converging trends. Uh, more electric aircraft from larger aircraft and very small electric aircraft. And those trends are going to converge. You're going to see larger and larger aircraft going more and more electric over time and some of the more electric technology from larger aircraft 
starting to filter down to nearly all transport category aircraft and starting to improve over time. So one thing you're going to see is more electric aircraft. This is like a Boeing 787 in the early 2000s, which switched to largely electric actuators, a larger battery pack, more electric power distribution. That's really just the beginning of what this revolution is going to entail. You're going to see larger aircraft adopting the solid state power electronics, and you're going to see high voltage power distribution lines that are going to be higher voltage than currently. You're going to see uh, station-based power conversion. So you're not just going to have massive amounts of uh, cabling and harnessing all over the plane. You're going to be able to see high voltage backbones with certain position stations on the plane that transition that power down to the 120 volt AC or the 5 volt DC that you need. And you're going to see electrohydraulic actuators replacing hydraulic lines. Hydraulic lines are going to go away. That's just one aspect of how electrification is going to affect the industry. This may be a little different than what you were thinking coming in, that it's all just about pure electric propulsion aircraft. Um, so it's really about these electric motors and solid state power electronics, not so much about where the energy comes from. I think when you talk about electrification as the third revolution in aviation, a lot of this skepticism and also the enthusiasm tends to center around the energy source, whether that's batteries or some people are promoting other sustainable fuels, uh, hydrogen, um, people are looking at uh, liquid natural gas um, from renewable sources. It's, but it's not really about where the energy comes from. And really, electricity and jet fuels or biojet fuels are likely to be the majority of the energy sources that are used in the near future. It's really about how that energy is used. It's not just like the jet revolution didn't really depend on whether you, you were using JP4, Jet A, Jet B. It's uh, really about the 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 conversion of that energy into actual propulsive force and into useful work, whether that's from actuators or whether that's from actually people plugging in their phones to the back of a seat. That's really where modern power electronics and electric motors and electric machines are going to change things far beyond what's actually possible right now with current batteries. So when you look at uh, where electric motors and solid state power electronics are going to change things and why they're going to change things. One reason is that they're highly scalable. So when you look at, let's say, jet engines, you chop a jet engine in half, it's not half the power, it's significantly less power and significantly less efficiency. Jet technology is very scale dependent. Um, so when you look at smaller aircraft, they're still using internal combustion engines largely because you scale a jet engine down to 100 kilowatts, it's going to be extremely inefficient. Um, but electric motors, whether they're very small or very, very large, everything from this few kilowatts all the way up to tens of megawatts, it's same fundamental technology, really, um, when you look at it. And you can also look at multiples. You don't, if you want to get 10 megawatts of power, you can't just take, typically in an aircraft, you don't want to put 10 jet engines on there that all produce a megawatt. But with electric motors, it's just as viable to put 10 1 megawatt motors. And in fact, there's actually some potential aircraft level efficiency benefits that can come from it. So that's one reason why the electrification revolution is coming, is that scalability aspect. And the same really applies to power electronics. A lot of the fundamental um, power electronics, whether it's silicon carbide or some of the new gallium nitride systems that are coming out, in fact, we're testing some on our 367 aircraft in the next few months for this RPE program. Um, they're very scalable. You put one, you can string a thousand together, and when, when you're looking at MOSFETs and some of these systems that are out there, and they're going to be producing simply more power with equal efficiency to these smaller, um, these smaller individual units. So that, that's just something you don't really have with the thermodynamics of jet engines and the Brayton cycle. Can't chop it into thousands of of pieces, uh, your, your, your APU generator, and expect that you're going to have the same performance. So it's, it's really something that's, that's new with, uh, with electric machines. Now, I don't think that people have fully realized the implications of that when it comes to traditional aircraft design. 
just wing body tail, two under, under wing engines, that's probably going to be the way that long haul aircraft are going to look for quite a while. But that does not mean that the electrification world isn't going to impact those planes, or that it shouldn't already be starting to impact those planes, even if the OEMs haven't quite realized it yet. When you look at power, data distribution, high efficiency power conversion, quite a few changes that can occur on aircraft becoming more and more electric. On the far other end of the spectrum, it started with small drones um, that went pure electric, um, getting larger and larger, and now you're seeing the very first electric training aircraft that are pure electric. So these are um, one, two-seat aircraft, some are already on sale right now, that do some basic flight training with very limited endurance and very limited payload. Um, very tiny aircraft out there right now. And so that's really where electric technology and our current batteries get us today. Um, in the next coming years, it's going to get us to larger and larger platforms, pure electric. Um, but there's some severe limitations in terms of uh, your IFR reserves and being able to fly in, in really commercial applications beyond just short hop by uh, VFRs right now that are being looked at for things like EV tolls. Um, they're emerging, but it's really the reserves and commercial considerations that are driving needs for better batteries. So that leads us to hybrids. So hybrids kind of bridge the gap between these very large planes that are not suitable even yet for hybridization and the very small planes that are the only planes currently that are able to go pure electric, although those planes will get bigger and bigger that can go pure electric over time when you start looking, and longer and longer ranges. And so that's the space that Ampere is playing in right now for electrification, is hybridization. And that's really where we feel in the next, let's say, decade, the majority of the practical developments in commercial aviation are going to come. Um, and it's going to feed a lot of the technology that will also filter up into these larger, more electric aircraft. And so when we talk about hybrid electric aircraft, you're going to be looking at aircraft that are in the 19 passenger and below size right now, just given current regulations and given current uh, technology limitations with batteries and high power systems. But it's very scalable to larger aircraft. It's not really about the size of the aircraft for hybrids so much as the distance the plane needs to fly, the reserves the plane needs, the altitude the plane needs to fly at, and how much uh, payload fraction the plane needs. So when you look at something like a turboprop, an ATR-72, or a Dash 8-like mission, that's actually quite viable uh, in the very near future, even with current batteries, for hybridization. So what you're going to see in the next decade is you're going to see more and more of the GA small planes uh, going pure electric, probably not going to get much beyond uh, four to six passenger size pure electric in very limited range um, in the, the next decade. You're going to see hybrids spanning up to 19 passenger planes, and you're going to see planes, demonstrations at least in the next decade, of planes in the mid-sized turboprop range. Um, now these planes, right at first, just like early jets, will look a little bit more like traditional aircraft. Um, we think there's going to be a vestigial phase that's very necessary to start with more traditional designs to prove out electric propulsion. Uh, I think that's the majority of what you're going to see in practical, saleable aircraft that are flying real commercial routes. They're going to look a little bit more like traditional planes, perhaps with some new features. But the next stage beyond that is more radical designs. That includes distributed electric propulsion, which I talked about earlier, where you have electric motors distributed on multiple areas of the plane. It's going to include things like new plane designs, where you have highly loaded wings like the NASA, NASA X-57, enabled by lift enhancement um, from electric propellers. Um, you're going to see things like boundary layer ingestion, um, which is our tailwind concept, but also NASA has looked at that with their 81 um, large um, uh, actual transport category aircraft. Um, so you're going to see sub uh, 500 mile, sub 1000 kilometer routes in the next 15 to 20 years becoming possible in larger aircraft. These are going to be regional jet slash turboprop size aircraft. And it's really, again, not about the size of the plane so much as how far it's flying, how fast it's flying, the altitude at which it's flying that really determines how difficult it is 
to hybridize or in the future become pure electric for planes like that. Um, and then you're going to see larger planes even. What about longer range planes, larger planes? Well, they're not going to necessarily look like hybrids initially in the sense that we're talking about, where a significant portion of their cruise power and their whole operational power is going to come from batteries or from grid power. And that's not really in the next decade and possibly even the next 15, 20 years going to be a factor for longer range, higher speed aircraft. However, when you look at hybridization in the sense of takeoff assist, you're going to be able to really look at how do you cruise optimize aircraft, uh, even very long haul aircraft, if you have the ability to do things with electrification that can enable you to better cruise optimize an aircraft. This includes things like takeoff assist, um, so geared systems that uh, enable your turbofan to be sized for cruise but to get additional performance and takeoff, or auxiliary propulsors that are just used in takeoff. Um, you see those for some VTOL aircraft right now where they have electric just to take off for a short period of time and then their cruise is using combustion engines. The same sort of concept of design a plane for cruise but have your electric system provide the off-nominal conditions in takeoff and landing to provide some advantages. So when you look at how you could actually cruise optimize a plane and get efficiencies, that's going to bring electrification into larger aircraft, I think, sooner than most people think, well before you have the miracle batteries that exist. Now, you're not going to be flying a pure electric 777, again, like I said earlier, from LA to Shanghai anytime soon. That does not mean that the future long-haul aircraft uh, will not be radically different from right now. And I think it's difficult to predict all the changes, but you can see things like APUs. I think APUs are going to be going away. That's a very big impact on our industry. You're going to see generators on the primary engines, and you're going to see an increased size battery pack that's going to be able to start the engines and be able to restart them in any area, any altitude. So it's not going to be dive below 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters before you can start your APU. Your battery pack is going to be able to operate at all altitudes. You're even going to see on shorter range routes possibly a drawdown battery pack that's plugged in at the gate and is just used for onboard power, allowing your engines to focus on cruise propulsion. Again, some of these are, are speculative, but that's just some of the ways that electrification could impact planes across the industry. So I think that's really key to look at. For the planes themselves, electrification does not just mean pure battery electric planes of all sizes are going to come in the next 10 years and every plane is going to be electric but there's going to be massive changes to planes of essentially any size role in mission based on electric technology and high power electronics. And you're also going to see, though beyond the planes themselves, a big change coming to the aviation ecosystem. And some of this is going to happen faster than the planes themselves and yet leverage some of the same infrastructure. What this involves is things like simple as plugging in planes at gates and using offboard HVAC. That's already proven impossible right now, but with pushback from the environmental movement and from policymakers, I think you're going to see it being standard in the future. APU is off at gates, you're plugged in, and HVAC is coming from off board. Um, you're not going to be cycling your APU, spending all of that money in fuel and cycles and extra hours on your APU just to provide power at the gate. I think planes are going to use off board power whether that is mobile or provided at the gate with fixed infrastructure, including engine start, that's going to likely be off-board going in the future. You're going to see things like electric GPUs becoming more common. Those already exist, but business jets aren't going to be able to pull up to airports anymore, just keep their engine running forever when they're on the ground. You're going to see, or you're not going to see the diesel generator GPUs anymore. You're going to see plugged into grid power. Um, you're going to see shuttle buses at airports, electric tubs at airports, you're going to see full-size transit buses at airports. All of this stuff is going to push infrastructure into airports for charging infrastructure, power distribution, that will later be used for planes. Then you're also going to even see things like solar and storage at airports. Airports are the perfect secure locations for with brownfield sites to install renewable energy and grid storage. They're also critical infrastructure. And you keep hearing about airports losing power and having all the travelers stranded. That's going to be 
solved by better battery uh, backup systems at airports and generation at airports, especially for remote airports. That's going to be very useful in land constrained areas like islands in Hawaii or the Orkney Islands. And you're going to see this especially in developing countries, areas where you have significant problems citing renewable energy and storage and infrastructure. They're going to be, need to be at secure facilities to prevent theft, to prevent damage. Airports are a prime location for that. All of this ground infrastructure, these ground vehicles, and solar and storage or, or other forms of renewable energy generation and storage are going to have a positive feedback loop with planes. As planes drive infrastructure, the infrastructure get built out of airports, more ground operations become possible, more aviation op operations become possible, and it's kind of this positive feedback loop. So again, electrification means so much more than just battery electric planes. It's really going to touch every aspect of aviation from ground ops to long distance flights. And again, you see why, why is this needed right now? Well, everyone knows kind of about the flight chain movement, pushback from policymakers on aviation emissions, and that's just going to grow. And you also have increasing costs, fuel costs that are a large percentage of airline budgets. So it's not just about going green. It's not just about this cool new technology. There's going to be push externally to adopt electrification regardless of the economics, regardless of the technical viability, we have to solve this problem if aviation is going to continue to expand globally or even maintain its current footprint. And you really can see an efficiency stagnation and an innovation stagnation since really the 1980s in terms of aircraft of all sizes. And I think this third revolution is really set to change that. Now, I don't have a crystal ball. Some of what I said might not come to pass, but Really, when you are looking at any type of plane right now, regardless of what segment of the aviation industry you're in, you need to be thinking right now about how electrification might impact your segment of the industry and how you might be able to leverage some of these new electronic technologies that are coming in, in various forms right now and being driven by literally trillions of dollars of investment in the electric automotive industry, consumer electronics, and defense spaces. So it's great to be able to chat with you about all of this. I'm looking forward to the future panel, and I'm looking forward as well to the question and answer session that's going to follow right now. Thank you.